Good afternoon, everybody. I think in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, on the next session, 10, uh, View Beyond uh, Cardiology. Our first speaker is Dr. Yuji Shiba, who is the head of Department in Biotechnology and Biomedical Engineering uh, in Shinsu University here in Japan. So uh, he's going to talk about cardiac regeneration with iPSC-derived cardiac spheroids in non-human primates. Thank you for the kind intro introduction. And I, I also thank uh, Jay and Kuda-sensei for, for including me uh, in this uh, wonderful meeting. I was impressed by the scientific quality as well as uh, great hospitality. So, so I'd like to start my presentation by uh, summarizing a current status of cardiac regeneration with pluripotent stem cells. As you acknowledge, mul multiple clinical studies are underway, including France, Germany, and Japan. However, there are still several uncertainties remaining, such as immune response following allogenic cardiomyocyte transplantation and the risk of, um, risk of uh, post-transplant arrhythmia. I believe that more clinical studies, particularly with large animal models, are required to address these uh, issues. So our lab has been working with non-human primate models to address following these issues. The first one is uh, to understand and regulate immune response following allogenic cardiomyocyte transplantation. This study is ongoing, and we haven't had any conclusive evidence, so I'm not going to talk about this today. We, also, we have also validated cell transplantation procedure, which I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this today. So currently, there are two approaches uh, for, uh, for cardiomyocyte transplantation, direct injection and epicardial delivery of engineered heart tissue, and long-term cell survival and efficacy were, both, were, uh, were uh, shown by both approaches. But the big, biggest difference is uh, electrical consequences, consequences following transplantation. When we transplanted um, cardiomyocytes directly into the muscle layer of the heart, we could see electrical int integration with host cardiomyocytes. And integrated uh, immature cardiomyocytes could cause post-transplant arrhythmia as an adverse effect. On the other hand, epicardial delivery of cardiac tissue seems to lead to no or limited electrical integration and no post-transplant arrhythmia. We have, transpla we have transplanted cardiomyocytes with pro-survival cocktail, including maitre gel, which was reported by Michael Fram and Chuck Marie Group in 2007, and saw evidence of cardiac regeneration in guinea pigs and monkeys. But this, requ this approach required many cardiomyocytes, and there's, a, there's also the risk of the use of chemically undefined factors. So um, the, our collaborator, Dr. Fukuda, developed novel, cardiac, novel uh, cardiomyocyte aggregates, what they call cardiac spheroids, and, and so that the transplanted cardiac, cardiac spheroids are survived more effectively than dispersed cardiomyocytes. So we first tested whether intracranial transplantation of Polypotent stem cell derived cardiac spheroids um, demuscularized injured heart, demuscularized, uh, um, survived in, in, the, in the heart in um, non human primate model. This procedure can be performed via transcatheter approach, and there's no need for a thoracotomy. Also, this, ha this approach has been widely used uh, with other cell types, such as bone marrow cells and mesenchymal stem cells. And we assume that transplanted cardiomyocytes may survive effectively with sufficient blood supply. We thought that a small size or number of cardiac spheroids um, didn't, uh, didn't retain and survive effectively, while large size or number of cardiac spheroids induced ischemic cardiac injury. 
So we pre prepared three sizes of cardiac steroids, small, medium, and large, as well as dispersed cardiomyocytes. Uh, so we transplanted iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes into left anterior descending artery by a femoral artery puncture in no human primate model. After confirmation, the anatomy of the LAD, we placed a, a microcatheter in the mid LAD and injected cardiomyocytes through this microcatheter. When we transplanted dispersed cardiomyocytes or small size of cardiac steroids, we couldn't see any grafted cardiomyocytes or scar formation at four weeks post-transplantation, indicating transplanted cardiomyocytes were just washed out to the systemic circulation. When we transplanted medium or large size of cardiac steroids, we could see some grafted cardiomyocytes identified by human-specific cardiac troponin I, but also see some uh, substantial scar formation by picrocereus red staining. This table summarizes the results. When we transplanted dispersed cardiomyocytes or a small size of cardiac steroids, we couldn't see any grafted cardiomyocytes or scar formation. Some recipients of medium or large cardiac steroids showed some uh, grafted cardiomyocytes, but also see some scar formation. It seems that larger, si larger number of cardi cardiac steroids resulted in larger size of scar formation. And one animal, this animal, died during cell transplantation. Taking, the, taking these findings together, we concluded that this approach was an e efficient procedure for cardiac regeneration. Next, we tried to confirm if, trans if direct injection of iPS cell derived cardiac steroids regenerate um, injured non human primate hearts. For this experiment, cardiac steroids were produced from cryopreserved clinical grade iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes at Keio University and then transported in saline solution at four, four degree to a facility in Matsumoto, which is 210 kilometers away and takes up to four hours. We confirmed that the viability of cardiac steroids were maintained for four hours at four degree. So this slide uh, showed the in vivo transplantation protocol Cardiac injury was produced by ischemia reperfusion of LAD two weeks before cell transplantation. And 10 animals were treated with 20 million iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes in cardiac steroids or just saline solution. Echocardiography was um, performed to, uh, to, um, to evaluate cardiac contractile function before cell transplantation and four weeks and 12 weeks post transplantation and Holta EKG was recorded once a week. And animals were uh, sacrificed at 12 weeks post-transplantation. And histological analysis revealed that there were relatively small grafts identified by human-specific cardiac troponin I, and the uh, grafted card cardiac tissue showed similar striated pattern to host cardiomyocytes. And echocardiography revealed that the recipients of cardiac steroids shown in red showed better contractile function than those of vehicle at four weeks post-transplantation. But the difference in fractional shortening was not significant at 12 weeks post-transplantation. When we see the recordings of Holter EK, Holter EKG, we couldn't see any ventricular tachycardia in the recipients of vehicle. And the recipients of cardiac Freud showed similar trend in arrhythmia. But when we take a close look at the instance, one animal showed just a transient VT. Now, I'd like to summarize the data so far. Transplantation of 20 million iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes in cardiac steroids resulted in small grafts with no or few instances of post-transplant arrhythmia. 
cardiac contractile function was significantly improved in the recipient of cardiac steroids at four weeks, but not significantly different at 12, week, 12 weeks post-transplantation. We hypothesized that the relatively modest functional benefits and low incidences of arrhythmia were attributed to uh, lower cell inputs, so we decided to increase the number of cardi cardiomyocytes in the next set of experiments. Here, pre we prepared another 10 animals and induced ischemic diperfusion injury. One animal died immediately after the injury, and the rest of the animals were treated with 60 million iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes in cardiac steroids or just saline solution. The protocol is essentially the same as previous study. And the histology revealed that there were um, substantial remuscularization identified by human specific cardiac troponin I, and the graph size was a 13 fold increase compared to that in the recipients of 20 million iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes. And graft, grafted cardiomyocytes were well vascularized with endothelial cells identified by tomato lectin, and also, sh also showed um, abundant expression of cardiohearing and gap junction protein connection 43 shown in green here. And echocardiography and CT analysis showed that the recipients of cardiac steroid showed better cardiac contractile function at four weeks and 12 weeks post-transplantation. And recordings of Horta EKG showed no incidence of VT in the recipients of BQ, which is consistent with the previous work. And the recipients of cardiac field, two, re two recipients of cardiac field showed transient VT. When we compare post-transplant arrhythmia burdens among non-human primate studies, you will find that the incidence of BT was relatively low in this study. We don't know, we don't know for sure that the, responsible for, uh, the mechanism responsible for a relatively lower incidence of arrhythmia in this study, but we speculated that it's related to the characteristic of cardiomyocytes. The cardiomyocytes transplanted in this study were 99.8% cardiac troponin T positive cardiomyocytes, and most of them um, expressed mature ventricular marker MLC2V in green, and action potential pattern also indicates um, ventricular subtype. In addition, cardiomyocytes are responsive to beta adrenal receptor agonist isoproteinol and anti-arrhythmic medication, amiodarone, and ACN4 channel blocker, ivabradine, indicating post-transplant arrhythmia could be manageable. Now, I'd like to summarize. Transplantation of 60 million iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes in cardiac steroids substantially muscularized infected monkey heart with a few instances of post-transplant arrhythmia. The recipients of cardiac steroids showed significantly better cardiac contractile function for, for 12 weeks. The relatively lower incidence of post-transplant arrhythmia may attribute to uh, cardiomyocyte characteristics, which is relatively mature ventricular cardiomyocytes. In conclusion, clinical grade iPS cell derived cardiac steroid can be transported and regenerate primate heart with acceptable risk of post-transplant arrhythmia. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I, I'd be happy to take questions if you have. So maybe I'll start uh, while we're waiting. Um, so with your arrhythmias, wi with your transplantation with the 12-week low incidence, do you think that the risk of arrhythmias would be cumulative in other words, it sounds like you would have to give injections of cells every 12 weeks. So do you think that the risk increases over time? I don't think, I actually, I don't think so because arrhythmia is just transient. Usually just, uh, just within uh, four weeks and then disappeared. Uh, nice work. I have two questions. Uh, were the monkeys immunosuppressed? 
Yes. For three months? Yes, exactly. With, okay. um, with combination of methylprednisolone and I think tacrolimus and um, uh, abacet, abacet. And did you examine any animal beyond three months? No, no. So we still don't know how long these yeah, cells yeah. will survive, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. So, so we should, we should, but, but I think it, 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 it should be done in human, I, I, I think. Not, not monkeys, because it costs a lot. It costs more in humans. <laughs> 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 anyway, nice work. Thank, Thank you. you. So very nice work. Um, it, you, it said f from your previous exper experience where you have injected 800 uh, million cells and, and now 60 million, if you compare the muscle retention, do you have, it looks similar or do you have? Uh, yes, that's the point. That's one point. So when we transplanted 400 million iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes in previous study in monkeys, the um, um, graft terrier is a little bit a bit uh, larger than, than this study, but not so different. And, and, and is it, could it be that the, that the, that the arrhythmias that, that have been observed um, are also triggered by, by cell death and inflammation, uh, which may have happened um, because you have lost many more cells with these larger doses than what you're using now? Yeah, yeah, maybe that's the reason. May, uh, I, uh, again, I'm not sure for uh, for so, so for, a for I'm not sure the mechanism responsible for the lower incidence of arrhythmia in this study. But that that might that might explain. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Um, great study. Um, I'm just wondering about um, y the integration that you showed. You just showed one image. Have you quantified to what extent your grafts integrate with the host tissue? I um, mean, what percentage of the cells are well integrated, or, or do you see areas where there's not integration? Um, I haven't actually um, precise uh, exper experiments for, for the cell in integration, but um, um, yes, that's a good question. Um, maybe I, I, I will check that. Okay. Great work, Yuji. You, um, uh, two small questions. The, do you have any data comparing, uh, maybe sequencing on, on your old cell preps compared to these, the phenotype? And second small one, uh, did you change control rate freeze or, or, or s in, in the cryopreservation of these larger spheroids compared to single cell suspensions? Uh, actually, no and no. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't that. So I did. I, I did. I did either either of the experiments. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Dale Abel, who comes from UCLA Department of Medicine. He's a chair in endocrinology, um, and his talk is on metabolism and heart failure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jay and Keiji, for um, the invitation to. This conference has been very um, informative. I've learned a lot, and I will teach you hopefully a little bit about heart metabolism. And I thought I'd start off with um, highlighting some recent publications in humans, which I think have um, been very important contributions to the field. Um, two from Zoltarani's lab, and one from um, Oliver Radis Group in Oxford. So these are patients with um, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. They are fasting, so the heart is essentially living on fat. And you can see that um, in, in the normal individuals, um, about 86% of myocardial um, uh, substrate use is from the oxidation of um, lipids. Whereas in patients with um, heart failure, that drops to about 72%. And there's a concomitant increase in um, ketone and lactate use by these hearts. In the same um, hearts, um, Zoltz um, then went on to look at um, tissue metabolomics. And again, what was observed in these patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy was a reduction in fatty acid metabolites shown here um, in these two volcano plots, and um, an increase in certain glucose metabolites, um, specifically free glucose, sorbitol, and fructose. Now, um, in terms of other metabolites, there, were, there were an, was an increase in tissue um, and um, ketones, probably largely driven by increased delivery of ketones from the plasma. And um, importantly, branched chain amino acids were um, <coughs> increased um, in these hearts and as, as a consequence of um, decreased um, metabolism. 
this is a second study from Oxford, and what they did was, again, in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and again, with um, AV, cast AV catheterization, um, looking at um, both uptake and release of metabolites, um, patients were either given um, glucose and insulin infusions, or they were giving, given an intralipid infusion. The idea being, could you modulate metabolism in the heart, and did this correlate with um, any, any increase in function? What I want to point out from these slides is that the heart actually secretes metabolites as well as using metabolites. And I put some arrows beside a few metabolites that were secreted both in response to um, insulin and glucose, and specifically I want to sh have your attention focused here on sorbitol, as well as um, release metabolites. I want to focus your attention both on ceramides as well as succinate. This is just a summary of what I just showed you, where that when you um, gave um, glucose and insulin to these um, heart failure patients, you saw an increase in um, pyruvate and glucose use. When you gave more, more lipids, you saw an increase, interestingly, in glucose, ketone use, fatty acid use, and pyruvate use, but you saw a secretion of ceramides and glycerol. Um, glycerol. Think of these as toxic lipids. Um, and, and similarly, um, with regards to increasing flux through insulin and glucose, an increased um, secretion of sorbitol. So even though there's some evidence of flexibility, um, there is still some abnormalities in terms of um, the metabolic response um, t in, 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 in terms of the metabolites which are um, secreted from the heart. There was a small increase in LV function with the intralipids, no, no real change in people who were given the um, insulin and glucose. Finally, in terms of just reviewing the um, literature, another important paper just came out um, from um, Kavita Sharma's group and David Cass at Hopkins, and they actually looked at um, individuals with um, HEFPEF and HEFREF. And um, here's a picture of um, some data looking at um, tissue level metabolomics in that paper. This is a, um, a flower plot, and you can see the green line around here is showing um, the normals, and then the blue and red lines here are showing the patients with um, HEFPEF and HEFREF, um, respectively. The point here is that um, there, again, is a reduction in tissue levels of um, both long and medium chain acyl carnitines, as well as a reduction in the, I'm sorry, a reduction in the expression of um, genes um, that um, regulate fat metabolism. So again, in these human studies, there's a, f a pretty consistent um, observation that there's a reduction in fatty acid use um, in the failing heart. Some more um, points from that paper which I thought were really interesting was um, comparing what happens to ketone metabolism, comparing um, HEFF patients with HEFREF patients. You can see again that in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, there's increased levels of um, ketones relative to patients with um, HEFPEF um, as, as shown here. And again, a tendency towards slightly more um, circulating ketones in the, um, HEF, um, PEF in the, in the HEFREF patients. And then um, in terms of um, um, glucose or glycolytic metabolites, I want to point your attention to an interesting um, dichotomy here, looking at um, the accumulation of pyruvate in the hearts of patients with HEFPEF, but not in the hearts of patients with HEFREF. And then I, my eye caught this important gene, insulin receptor substrate 2, or IRS2, which is one of the most um, um, importantly repressed genes um, in, in, in the hearts of patients with um, HEFPEF. So on a pivot note to some work that we have done focusing specifically both on um, pyruvate metabolism in the heart and also some work on IRS2 um, signaling um, in the heart. So again, um, just to summarize what I told you, and this was actually um, a, a carton from a review written by myself and Gary Lovashek and others, um, essentially showing what I just showed in the humans, but this was actually before those human papers came out, that in, in fact, in heart failure, all metabolism is down. Um, maybe with the exception of um, glycolytic carbon use. Um, and one of the um, important concepts I want to leave with you in terms of the, the, this increase in glycolysis is that um, there, th when there's accumulation of glycolytic intermediates, there are these offshoots of glycolysis where the carbons go. Um, Jose Nariholi this morning talked about, um, the, pen, uh, about the hexosamine bisynthetic pathway as one example of that, but there are other pathways, including the polyol pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway, one carbon metabolic pathways, which, uh, which all see increased flux in the context of heart failure because of the inability of the mitochondria to completely oxidize um, the glucose carbons. 
So the broad concept that I want to think about is that oftentimes when we think about mitochondrial metabolism and heart failure, we think, well, that the heart is just making less ATP. And that's true. But the other point I think which is important to recognize is that the carbons are still available. The carbons are coming in, and they're coming into mitochondria, which are impaired, and so the carbons go elsewhere. And a, a number of years ago, myself and Torsten and Derns already had kind of postulated that it's the movement of these carbons into these other metabolic pathways that potentially could be um, contributing to the, um, pathophysi the pathophysiology of heart failure. Let me show you some unpublished data from our lab looking at um, heart failure patients. So these are HEF, um, REF patients, um, end-stage cardiomyopathy patients. Um, and um, when we did um, metabolomics on their hearts, again, what we saw was that the most highly induced uh, metabolites were, again, these group of metabolites. The top arrow is sorbitol, the next arrow is, is mannose, and then the third arrow down is galactose. And why might this be important? Well, it, it could be important because it turns out that um, mannose um, actually um, can lead to N-linked glycation, um, which can promote extracellular remodeling and infl inflammatory signaling. Sorbitol um, can lead to depletion of NADPH and glutathione, which actually promotes um, oxidative stress. And then galactose down to um, galactosamine has been shown by many to actually very aggressively activate ROS, age, and rage signaling leading to, to inflammation. So the idea here is that the myocyte is not necessarily keeping all these metabolites in itself. These are potentially um, coming out into the interstitium. You can certainly detect some of these metabolites in the circulation, but I think where the field is probably gonna be going now is looking at metabolites that are coming out from the, f um, the, the failing myocyte and the influence of these metabolites on the behavior of cells um, within the interstitium. So we were very interested in this um, a number of years ago, and we really wanted to create a model where we were going to impair the movement of glucose carbons um, in glycolysis. And to do this, we inactivated the expression of the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier. And the idea was that this would then lead to accumulation of pyruvate, lactate, and other glycolytic intermediates. Um, so this is just to show that we, 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 we were successful. We knocked out the pyruvate carrier one, and um, the pyruvate carrier two, MPC2, was also degraded. Mitochondrial pyruvate uptake was reduced, um, as well as pyruvate-supported mitochondrial respiration. But respiration for other substrates was, um, was, was, was preserved. Importantly, and consistent with our model, that um, we saw that there was spillover of glucose into other pathways. So here, for example, is increased oglucnac modification of proteins in these um, CMPC1 um, mutant hearts as quantified here, as well as um, increased um, um, accumulation of glycogen, another, another carbon that we looked at, among others. Phenotypically, what happened to these hearts was that there was a progressive um, maladaptation of the heart um, through a, a, a stage that, for all practical purposes, looked like HEFPEF that then evolved into um, a dilated cardiomyopathy um, phenotype. And we were able to modulate the phenotype by actually flooding the hearts with other substrates. So we gave them either a ketogenic diet, high ketones, or um, a high fat diet, and saw a dramatic reversal of the cardiac phenotype. You can see here, starting off with animals um, at about eight weeks of age with significant ventricular hypertrophy um, and um, LV dysfunction on a ketogenic diet, you can see um, a significant reversal of the cardiac hypertrophy and a restoration of the um, ejection fraction. Importantly, um, this was characterized by the hearts that were essentially living almost exclusively on fatty acids um, and a, a, a complete reduction on their, on their use of, um, of glucose. And in fact, some evidence of that is that we saw a reversal in oglucnat modified proteins as well as a normalization of glycogen. And so the concept here we think that this model has um, informed us is that um, the accumulation of glucose metabolites in the heart potentially can um, exacerbate um, heart failure through a number of mechanisms, I think, to be um, defined. Okay, let's just talk briefly about um, IRIS-2 signaling on the heart. Recall that was the most, one of the most repressed proteins in the, um, in the um, hearts of the recently published um, study of HEFPEF that was um, presented um, by um, the Hopkins group. Now, um, like everybody else, um, we are going into single cell RNA sequences as well, and um, so Ji Jun Wang, who is in the lab, um, had generated a model looking at um, transverse aortic um, constriction in wild-type animals or in obi obi mice. In obi obi mice, after TAC, they actually preserved their, their EF. 
um, but have some evidence of diastolic dysfunction. What I want to point out here is that you can, if you look at the patterns of various cell types, you can see that um, there, is, there are changes in, 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 in the, in, in the um, various cell populations depending on conditions, and they are not uniform. So for example, if you look, for example, at cardiomyocyte 3, you can see that the OBTAC really has a, a different um, distribution of those cells relative, for example, to the um, wild type type. So um, more specifically, looking at IRS proteins, um, Jijin actually looked at expression levels of IRS1 um, and IRS2. The impressive thing to me initially when I saw this data was that most of the IRS1 in the heart is in the fibroblast. Um, and um, then there is IRS1 in parasites and in, in cardiomyocytes um, as well. And there's significantly more IRS1 than IRS2 in the heart. And again, but IRS2 is also um, very much enriched um, in fibroblasts, although there's still significant expression um, within um, cardiomyocytes. So studies are underway now to actually look at dissecting the relative contributions of these iris um, isoforms in different specific um, cellular compartments um, within the heart. Now, um, in addition, I was gonna show you um, these sets of data from those studies, which um, is really showing that there's also heterogeneity in iris um, one and iris two expression in distinct cardiomyocyte subpopulations um, within the heart as, as, as shown here for IRS1, IRS2, and of course for the um, insulin receptor. And in the model which I told you about before, which is comparing wild type sham, wild type TAC, OB sham, and OB TAC, again, you can see that there's heterogeneity across these various um, cardiomyocyte clusters in the expression levels of IRS1 um, and in the expression levels of um, IRS2, and of course also in the um, insulin receptor. So a lot of the work that we have done, just kind of grinding up whole hearts, which I'm gonna show you some li a little bit and looking at the effect of mutating or inactivating um, expression of insulin receptor substrates um, in the heart, um, we now have to kind of revisit in terms of which specific cells are in fact driving some of the phenotypes that I will describe um, sub subsequently. So in some work that um, was done in collaboration with um, Isti Komoro's group um, a quite a few years ago, we showed that um, hyperinsulinemia, which occurs in heart failure as well as myocyte stretch, could actually activate a signaling pathway downstream of the insulin receptor to IRS1 and AK2. We followed up that work looking to try to understand the relative contributions of IRS1 and IRS2 um, to this um, phenotype. And um, in re relatively recently published work, we looked at um, IRS1 and IRS2 activation, both in human samples as well as in the mouse models. So these, these are human hearts. And essentially what we observed was that there was um, hyperphosphorylation of um, IRS1, but not IRS2 um, in failing human hearts, as well as hyperactivation of AKT1, but not um, AKT2. Then in a mouse model of transverse aortic constriction, we were able to rec recapitulate that, where we saw um, increased levels of IRS1, but not IRS2, and increased phosphorylation of IRS1, but not um, IRS2. And um, when we then um, knocked out either IRS1 or IRS2, we saw quite divergent phenotypes. So we looked at both two days and two weeks after transverse aortic constriction. So two days after TAC, um, every, everything is down in terms of EF, but after two weeks, the IRS1 knockouts in fact completely recover, whereas the IRS2 actually have um, more significant um, LV dysfunction. Um, you can also see that here with regards to um, cardiac hypertrophy, that the greatest degree of cardiac hypertrophy occurred in the IRS2 deficient hearts. Um, and the, as was the greatest degree of um, fibrosis. So IRS2 deficiency in the heart is bad um, in terms of the adaptability of the heart to um, pressure overload. Um, we, we then took these IRS1 knockout hearts and looked downstream in terms of what other signals was being were, were being activated. And we, we, we focused on AKT1 because we had seen that that was also selectively activated and created um, compound mutants where we um, had um, IRS2 knockouts crossed with AKT1 um, haploid insufficient mice. And what we observed again was that actually led to a rescue of the phenotype. Again, the hypertrophy that occurred um, in the IRS2 knockouts were in fact prevented when AKT1 um, was knocked out, as well as the maintenance of um, cardiac function. So to summarize then, um, reducing IRS2 signaling in the mouse heart exacerbates heart failure via AKT1 dependent signaling pathways. Um, so that um, when we um, reduce AKT1 signaling in the face of IRS2 deficiency, we actually um, get um, preservation of LV structure 
and LG function. Whereas um, reducing IRS-1 signaling while maintaining IRS-2 signaling, in fact, is um, cardioprotective. And mechanistically, um, we believe that, and we showed that some of this was at, um, involved a reduction in um, inflammatory genes. Now, of course, these are, this was bulk RNA, so we have to go back now and look at single cells to see w what, what, what cell populations is being driven by this, as well as an um, increase in um, cyclic GMP and PKG signaling. And finally, in some unpublished work, um, Chian Shi, a colleague at the University of Iowa, um, made a very interesting observation that if you took iris to deficient hearts and subjected them to um, caffeine epinephrine stimulation, um, these animals actually went into a ventricular tachyarrhythmia that looked for all practical purposes like VTAC. And when she looked in isolated hearts, looking at calcium um, 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 waves in these, in these hearts um, by direct um, microscopy in Langendorf hearts, this is a wild type heart giving epinephrine and, and caffeine. You see a nice increase in um, the calcium um, um, pattern, whereas in the iris 2 deficient hearts, you really see this very disorganized um, phenomenon, um, and this is quantified here, and really consistent with um, significant um, impairment in um, um, sarcoplasmic reticulum um, function. And without showing you all of the data in this manuscript, which is um, in revision right now, essentially what we were able to identify was that IRS2 sits at a very important signaling hub involving um, GRK2 and PIT kinase and AKT, whereas in the absence of IRS2, there's hyperactivation of AKT1, NOS1 and NOS3, CAM kinase 2, leading to um, impaired function of the ranidine um, receptor, ultimately leading to calcium overload and um, a calcium leak. And we were able to reverse this, for example, by creating mice that had a stabilized ranidine receptor. And also, we could um, reverse the phenotype by pharmacologically inhibiting um, AKT1. So I've taken you through a journey um, starting in, the, in human studies implicating um, accumulation of glucose carbons um, in the heart and showing you that certainly in most models when we genetically force the accumulation of, of, of glucose carbons, we can actually um, create a progressive model of um, abnormal ventricular um, remodeling that's reversible. And I've also showed you that um, IRS2 signaling, also shown to be markedly repressed in HFPEF hearts, uh, mechanistically might be driving signaling pathways that are linked both to um, left ventricular dysfunction as well as to an increased likelihood of arrhythmias um, in those hearts. Finally, we have looked now at the UK Biobank at IRS2 um, inactivating variants, and there's a clear association um, with these variants and um, various cardiovascular risks, including heart failure and including um, cardiac um, arrhythmias. So um, that's the tutorial today on at least a little bit of insulin signaling, a little bit of cardiac metabolism um, as, it, as, it, as it relates to um, heart failure. And I think that the future really is now looking at um, metabolite and signaling crosstalk in subcellular um, um, fractions um, within, within the heart. This is our COVID lab picture. This is mainly the Iowa crew. This is the LA crew. Um, five people moved with me to LA. That's my mom, by the way. So everybody comes and visits us in LA now. And so when they come, they help me to unpack um, boxes in the new lab. Um, and, and these are important collaborators who um, contributed to the work that I described. And hopefully there'll be a few seconds for questions. So Dale, uh, I'll ask the question. Um, so I'm surprised with the loss of IRS that you don't get compensatory signaling from other adapter proteins like the GAB protein or FRS proteins. And if you do, do you see differential signaling through the ERK signaling pathway and crosstalk to AKT from those yeah. pathways. So I think that, um, so with regards to, to the ERK, so um, certainly in the IRS2 deficiency, we actually do see some evidence of um, hyperactivation. But I think the, the, the key thing here, at least at the cellular level, is that the, the, I think the signaling is, is compartmentalized, right? I don't think that IRS1 and IRS2 and ERK and AKT are just in the cytosolic bag, right? I think that they're actually in specific organelles. And so that what we see when the expression of one or the other is reduced is who your partners in crime are in that, specific in that specific compartment. And then I think the other piece which we haven't yet explored is with cells, right? right? And I think that, that, th that 
we'll probably see different effects in different cells. And now the challenge is how, how can one actually do that level of signaling work at a, the, the resolution of, of, of single cells. We, we actually have some bioinformatics tools that we're playing with that might give us some hints there, but that's kind of where we, we want to take this. Great, excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. Our third speaker is Wong Kuk Lee, who comes from Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine in the Department of Cardiovascular Regenerative Medicine. Uh, and his talk will be on IPS-based platforms for disease modeling with sympathetic innervation in the heart. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Jay Tsang and Dr. Fuda for giving me such a uh, wonderful uh, opportunity. So uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, IPS-based platform uh, with the sympathetic innovation. So as an introduction, uh, please let me uh, briefly introduce our recent studies. So I have been, we have been uh, focusing on the disease modeling and the drug discovery studies. So, uh, so far, we have uh, established the disease, patient-derived disease-specific spec IPS cells, such as the Fabry disease, addition muscular dystrophy, and troponin T, DCM, and the Becker uh, muscular dystrophy. And we also uh, established a drug discovery platform, such as atrial toxicity or AFI model. So let me uh, introduce the one of the case uh, of a Fabry disease. Um, uh, we generated the IPS cells from the uh, Fabry uh, mother. Uh, she showed LVH and six sinus syndrome and atrial fibrillation. And uh, we uh, obtained IPS derived cardiomyocyte uh, after 550 days. Then we found a GB3 uh, lip glycolipid accumulated perinuclear region. So now uh, we found uh, Fabry disease has been uh, recapitulated even in a cardiac, after cardiac differentiation. However, uh, then we checked the gene expression of NPPA or NPPB, and uh, we found uh, hypertrophic genes has been uh, upregulated. So now uh, we expected cellular hypertrophy occurred, but uh, the result was uh, the cell area was even smaller and the arthmogenic uh, properties were not observed at all. So we are so much discouraged and uh, we wonder what is the reason. So we uh, attributed one of the uh, possible mechanisms as a immature properties. So now uh, you may agree, so one of the unsolved issues of IPS-derived cardiomyocyte might be the immature property of IPS cells derived cardiomyocyte uh, often hamper the establishment of uh, due to physiological inconsistency with native heart. Um, you may know uh, immature versus mature cardiomyocytes. So, uh, for example, in morphological aspect, immature uh, IPS derived cardiomyocytes show the polygonal shape compared to mature cells uh, aligned with and, and rod shaped morphology. As for contractility, uh, immature cells show the slow, conduct, uh, slow contraction. And uh, as for electrophysiology, such as a calcium transient or action potentials, immature cells are relatively longer uh, duration. And also, conduction was slow. So, uh, well, several methods have been applied to facilitate the maturation of IPS cells. For example, mechanical or electrical stimuli or solvable factors or topography, such as uh, aligned scaffold. And now uh, other strategies, for example, in vivo transplantation or 3D culture has been applied. But now, uh, well, in the first day uh, of this meeting, uh, the topics people are work talking about uh, non crosstalk with non cardiomyocyte. So now, uh, because I have been uh, working in arrhythmia research for a long time, so I'm being interested in uh, sympathetic neuron. So now, uh, let's check about the uh, review. So um, well, this review shows innovating sympathetic neuron regulate heart size. Actually, they uh, conducted a chemical aberration of sympathetectomy after uh, neonatal phase. Then uh, heart size was... Uh, 
significantly smaller compared to normal. And also, uh, this is uh, Dr. Ieda, Dr. Fukuda's work, uh, sympathetic innovation related heart rhythm. Uh, they use the semaphorin 3A, uh, the, the rep sympathetic repellent factors. Uh, they found uh, the mouse shows uh, life-threatening arrhythmias frequently. And finally, a dysfunctional innovation has a prognostic value in patients with cardiac disease. So that's uh, been the, even in clinical, uh, this sympathetic innovation is important. So now we raise hypothesis. Sympathetic innovation induces maturation of iPS cells. Then uh, they may cause heart development or cardiac function. To elucidate the uh, point, uh, we conducted the following experiment. The first, we established uh, the innovated iPS cardiac uh, construct. Then we checked, uh, we evaluated maturity. Then finally, uh, we investigated the mechanism. To do that, uh, we use human iPS cardiomyocyte. And as a sympathetic neuron, we use a superior uh, cervical ganglion derived neuron from neonatal rats. So we uh, compare the monoculture and the co-culture system. Slides show the morphological uh, property of sympathetic neuron and iPS cardiomyocyte when compared uh, co-cultures. So uh, cardiomyocyte shows the lot shape and with the contact region, uh, synapsin one is one of the uh, neuroexcitosis marker was expressed. Um, then we compared uh, the co-culture cardiomyocyte and the monoculture system. So uh, upper panel shows a monoculture. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, cardiomyocyte shows polygonal and fiber orientation is random. However, uh, in the co-culture system, surprisingly, uh, cells shows rod shape and uh, fiber orientation was totally aligned. So this, uh, this result shows uh, co-culture of cardiomyocyte and sympathetic neuron, not only uh, the cell morphological maturity, but also self-organization occurs. So to see, uh, we checked uh, time-lapse live cell imaging. The left panel shows a monoculture. So uh, cardiomyocyte shows a polygonal and random, random orientation. But in the uh, co-cultures system, uh, some part of the cell shows uh, well aligned and rod shaped morphology. Now we check the contractile properties using cell motion, uh, cell motion imager. And compared to monoculture system, co-culture system shows a faster contraction velocity and a faster relaxation velocity. We also checked the electrophysiological property, such as the calcium transient and action potential. So compared to a uh, monoculture system, a uh, calcium transient in a uh, co-culture system showed shorter duration. And even in action potentials, uh, the co-culture show cells showed shorter action potentials. This slide shows uh, electro electrophysiological property of conduction velocity. Uh, left panel shows the monoculture and right panel shows the co-culture. So, uh, well, both are very fast, so it's easy, uh, difficult to f find out that uh, uh, conduction properties, uh, conduction velocity was significantly um, increased in the culture system. So now uh, we found, a mon compared to monoculture, a uh, culture system shows uh, functional maturity in contractility and calcium transient and action potential and conduction. In, uh, in addition, we also found morphologically uh, co-culture uh, cardiomyocyte shows well-aligned uh, fiber orientation and uh, the rod-shaped morphology. Uh, we also checked the proliferative pro uh, proportion. So compared to a monoculture system, uh, co-culture system shows a decreased uh, proliferative pro proportion uh, evaluated by KI-67, and also uh, by nuclear portion was increased. 
So that's uh, as a short summary. Uh, sympathetic innovation have facilitated maturation of iPS cell cardiomyocyte uh, from morphological and electrophysiological uh, molecular aspects. So now, uh, what is the mechanism of cell organization and maturation? So uh, we uh, naturally occurring pressure is parkline or direct contact. So to elucidate the point, uh, we conducted the, the following experiment. We uh, culture the iPS cell cardiomyocyte, and we also use not the sympathetic neuron, but the conditioned medium of uh, sympathetic neuron culture. So the next slide shows the part summary. Uh, both conditioned medium treated cardiomyocyte and cultured cardiomyocyte. Both groups showed uh, functional maturation such as a shorter duration of calcium transient or action potential and uh, faster contractility. However, uh, in morphological aspect, a conditioned medium did not uh, cause uh, self-organization uh, such as uh, uh, fiber-oriented alignment. So uh, to further uh, investigate the mechanism, we conducted a transcriptomic analysis using bulk RNA sequence. So we conducted a monoculture of cardiomyocyte only and sympathetic neuron only. We also uh, conducted a co-culture, both with cardiomyocyte and sympathetic neuron. Then we checked. So results shows uh, the regulation, well, it is still uh, under uh, analysis, so I do not, I cannot explain in detail. However, uh, we found, for example, PSV kinase uh, was upgraded as a DEG. So now uh, we speculate, uh, such, well, as a um, downstream gene, so mTOR might be involved in cardiomyocyte or maturation and low signal uh, might be involved in cellular morphology and migration and priority. So as a summary, uh, sympathetic innovation cause uh, functional maturity through paracline effect. Then uh, self-organization or morphological maturation through direct control. So based on this uh, background, we are now going to uh, conduct recapitulation of heart development and the development of new tissue engineering technique and new therapeutic uh, strategy. So today's work is uh, 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 using this uh, opportunity, I'd like to thank all uh, collaborators, especially uh, the uh, sympathetic neuron study was done by Jun Li, and also probably this work is uh, done by uh, Dr. Kuramoto, and uh, under the uh, instruction of Dr. Komuro and uh, Dr. Naito. And I always thank uh, Dr. Fukuda for uh, continuous uh, support, scientific support. So that's all, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> Very nice presentation. Um, I have a question for you with regards to the co-culture. Do the, do the synaptic neurons proliferate? And if so, over time, do they overtake the culture so that you're really seeing results from the neurons as opposed to the cardiomyocytes? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question, but uh, we don't have much information about the neuron. And uh, uh, well, actually, uh, we checked the neuron uh, RNA sequence data, and when co cultured with the cardiomyocyte, neuron seems to have expressed uh, the certain cardio-related gene. So, so that's uh, really close talk, I think. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, how did you determine the uh, ratio of the sympathetic neuron and the cardiomyocyte in co-culture model? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, we tried many uh, combination, and uh, well, uh, I forgot the uh, exact number, but now uh, 
it's a one to five ratio would be the optimal combination. But, but it may change uh, in the due to the condition. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I want to know the, so you, you said the sympathetic neuron and direct contact regulates cardiomyocyte uh, alignment. But uh, I think the sympathetic neuron has a new right. So it that makes some uh, structure inst instruction to the cardiomyocyte? Yeah, that's uh, what I thought uh, in the past beginning. But, uh, well, new light may be very fragile or small compared to the uh, cardiomyocyte. And also, that's not necessarily a new light do not uh, align with the cardiomyocyte. Mm. So maybe uh, some other different mechanism, maybe. You are mentioning about the physical, mechanical alignment, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Yajing Wang, who comes from the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, she's also the Director of Basic and Translational Research, and her talk is on novel mechanisms in diabetic cardiac injury. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, being here today uh, till the end of the meeting. And uh, I'm very happy to be invited by the uh, CV, uh, BE meeting. And also, this the first time I attended and the first time to uh, come to uh, Japan. So far, I really love this place and love this meeting. Uh, today, I'm going to share some uh, uh, research journey in my lab and uh, what we found recently in the diabetic cardiac injury. As we know, one third of cardiac risk, uh, cardiovascular disease contributes to the uh, mortality and uh, deaths in the um, population of the patient who has uh, type two diabetes. And uh, therefore, our, uh, my lab is trying to understand why the diabetes influence the cardio cardiovascular disease so uh, impactfully. And then what, why is the, um, the fat cells uh, in the diabetes generated more fat cells? Why it can uh, cause the cardiovascular disease uh, accelerated is the risk of the, the heart disease. And uh, because there is um, uh, American Diabetes Association has been long time realized that um, uh, the diabetes patients, the first they didn't realize they had it till they have heart attack. And then the patients come to the clinic because of a heart attack. And then uh, di after diagnosis, they have been realized they have a long time of the diabetes and then lead to the their cardiovascular risks. So from this point of view, we understand why the fat cells contribute to cardiovascular disease so, uh, so dramatically, and we understand the fat cells, uh, the primary function uh, is the engineer storage. And however, why this can contribute to heart disease, and there are till 1990s, the people, um, first discovered adiponectin and reported and leptin, um, they start realize um, that fat cells, uh, other than the storage function of the energy, and then they can secrete a bunch of the stuff, other than the fat, free fat acids and cytokines, and they also how can um, uh, small molecules release and can affect to other remote organs, including the heart and the brain. So uh, from these uh, discoveries, and the, we reevaluate the adipocytes, uh, the fat tissues function, and start to think their major role is in the endocrine organ. And then this uh, endocrine function can influence so many other remote organs in the human body. So from the, uh, since 2007, uh, our lab start to uh, inv investigate of the fat cells and the current function, and we um, uh, discovered that adiponectin and uh, its parallel CTRP families, uh, they have one to 15 uh, family members, and they are uh, play important role in protect the heart, uh, the heart cells, 
and then if they lost their function and they cause uh, accelerated heart injury. And from those, uh, based on those uh, evidences, we start to thinking that um, heart injury is can be sensed by the endocrine dysfunction, and this is an uh, early um, uh, dysfunctional fat cells can lead to the uh, endocrine fun dysfunction and then uh, causes metabolic disor uh, disorders and contribute to the heart injuries. This is from the uh, lab basis, uh, we're trying to understand this terribly. And so far recently, we're trying to understand more and what the mediator causes of the cardiovascular disease accelerated uh, this injury in, in the diabetes patient. And we set up the model uh, from three different levels. Uh, we use um, the normal mm, animal, and then also we induce the pre-diabetes models uh, and the diabetes models. We combine this high-fat diet and combined, uh, combined uh, tech models induce heart injuries to um, generate uh, heart failure models. And then from the uh, data analysis this, uh, from single cell uh, data analysis, we realize the um, eight subtype of the heart cells and they all be affected. But the cardiomyocytes is considered the largest group there are a bunch of the genes still runs on the top uh, be affected in this uh, diabetes development process. And then when we're tracing down of the uh, subgroup of the um, heart cells, uh, the cardiomyocytes, uh, we categorize these um, mm, cells from major five groups. Uh, we found that uh, the second group of CM2 group uh, they uh, can, uh, in the diabetes development, they are very sensitive to be um, affected by the diabetes disease. And then from their own subgroup can generate almost 11 small groups and, and those cardiomyocytes are very sensitive to the diabetes injuries. Therefore, we were thinking uh, back to our original question, what's uh, what's uh, happened in the fat cells goes to the heart cells to affect heart cells function and make them cell death and what's the mediators. And we evaluate our plasma's um, level of the extracellular vesicles uh, because this uh, recently discovered small uh, extracellular vesicle can travel from the uh, distant organ to the heart and they have it, there is a nature potential to, me, uh, to be as serve as a mediator. And we measure the plasma uh, small extracellular vesicles, we found their level were dramatically increased in the after e uh, the diabetes development. Also the, uh, the heart cells can uptake those uh, small extracellular vesicles. And to verify if this um, diabetes uh, actual uh, vesicles exosomes can exhibit of the cardiac injury, we uh, transplanted of the fat cells, uh, the adipose tissues uh, from the diabetes animal models and implanted in it into a non-diabetic animal models. And we can see, um, although only we mm, doing the fat cells transplant and the cardiac injury was was increased in the non-diabetic uh, animal models, which means that fat cells play a, an important role in this accelerated cardiac injury. And then to identify what's uh, carried by those uh, small extracellular vesicles uh, after di in the diabetes model, uh, we do the lots of uh, assays, uh, combined with bioinformatic uh, assay, uh, we identify its mRNA, uh, it's a major carrier by these uh, small extracellular vesicles. And also we inhibit these um, um, mRNAs, we can, uh, we can find the apoptosis of the heart cells was uh, rescued. So to validate the, the, the data found from animal models, we uh, collect uh, mm, diabetes patients, pla uh, the plasma, and then we found those um, in the patients of diabetes, 
their small extracellular vesicles carry this mRNA was um, significantly increased. And also, we valid we using the um, diabetes patients' uh, extracellular vesicles to be isolated and then to uh, add it into the uh, diabetes cells. Uh, also, we added the inhibitors of this mRNA. We can see it uh, saved the cell from the cell death. And they rescue the apoptosis levels mm, in those um, isolated cells. Therefore, uh, we, we found this, um, mm, we discovered, we, think, we were thinking the fat cells in a healthy condition after it's um, in the diabetes process, it get to uh, expand their size and then start to release extra uh, more the small extracellular vesicles traveled from blood and then goes to the heart and deliver their toxic molecules, including this major one, it's mRNA 130B, uh, and then to hit the um, protective signals inside of the cardiomyocytes and uh, to generate more cell deaths. And this is um, uh, one mechanism we found uh, why diabetes uh, heart we have uh, acceler uh, accelerated injury. Therefore, to go over the original uh, thinking from the uh, how the endocrine functions and induce the adiponectin dysfunction and then lead to the heart injury, we also want to identify some biomarkers to indicate uh, those diabetes hearts, um, what e exactly can predict this uh, accelerated injury. Uh, because adiponectin, uh, hypoadiponectinia uh, in the uh, heart injury is um, uh, major contributors. And then we're using uh, adiponectin knockout mice and screen all the uh, mRNAs in the, compared to the wild type uh, we, between the group of the sham and uh, uh, ischemia heart. And then we identify these molecules, their behavior a little bit uh, bizarre uh, if compared to other molecules. Uh, we can see in the only the heart attack in wild type mice, it's decreased. However, in the mm, diabetes process, they, they are increased. So um, we, we found this mRNA 449B is the one could specifically induce in the diabetes condition. And also we validated if this identified the mRNA, the new, uh, the new molecules, if this uh, is, um, can have the cause effect to contribute this injured heart, we using the mRNA 449B overexpress and the inhibitors of this mRNA, uh, trying to see if the, uh, this mRNA can uh, modulate the cardiac injury. And then we can find from the uh, uh, gene letter and also uh, apoptosis caspase 3 analysis, we can see this, uh, we establish this cause effect relationship of the mRNA 449B to the accelerated uh, cardiac injur injury. Uh, for understand more what the mechanism why this 449B can induce this uh, uh, cardiac injury and we identified their downstream signalings and we found this 449B majorly targeted to the uh, anti-oxidative molecules, endogenous uh, anti-oxidative molecules. It's, um, so in the cell, in the uh, heart cell, they have uh, one set of the anti-oxidative stress molecules including the NERF-1 and the UCP-3. These two is the, their major targets, uh, which means 449B was released and um, was induced and released from the diabetic heart, heart cells. And then they are target to their own protective uh, molecules and uh, then drive to this accelerated injury. So to, to identify what uh, meaningful of this mRNA, and we also go back to the uh, clinic uh, significance and we collect the data from the diabetes patients uh, with and without ischemia heart um, injury disease of the patient's population. We found this mRNA for b how um, uh, market, markedly significance uh, elevated and also uh, it's the ROC curve indicates this 449B could be a biomarker to predict 
um, the diabetes uh, patients who will be have a higher risk of the cardiovascular disease. For make more, to make it more uh, significant, we uh, using the chip based accurate levels of measurement of miRNAs. Uh, we optimize the uh, method how to measure it out because this miRNA for for nib is uh, level is not that high, but their behavior uh, uh, can um, vary uh, nicely to car uh, car associate with the, this increased uh, uh, risks. Uh, therefore, we uh, op optimize this PCR uh, using this um, absolutely level digital PCR, and then we found this. If um, this miRNA level was uh, about to the four times higher in the um, diabetes patients, um, their absolute level is uh, copy numbers beyond 1,000 in a 10 p uh, kilogram of the hard RNAs, uh, which could be um, nicely um, predicts this uh, risk. So from this culture line, uh, we uh, display this uh, in diabetes patients. In the diabetes patient conditions, uh, the uh, uh, reduced adiponectin level can induce this miRNA for phone IB increase, and then to down, uh, down regulate their protective signals and then causes accelerated cardiac injury. So this is uh, what we found recently. And also we, uh, mm, we want to, like if the patients go back to the clinic, diabetes patient, to ask how we could protect our heart nicely. And the doctor usually answers the question like, uh, do exercise and then reduce your appetite, uh, maybe protect you well. However, we trying to, uh, from the lab, we trying to suggest it if we may be um, to give a, a diagnostic biomarker screening and then the patients maybe have uh, their dream life like still keep eating but keep sooner and no heart attack. Um, this is our dream and but also is the patient's dream. So all the works, I really appreciate all uh, my lab number, uh, members to help to do all the work. Also, my collaborator with Dr. Ma. Thank you. Um, so Yajing, I'll ask a question. So you've looked at a lot of the effects of um, adipocyte factors affecting the heart. Have you looked in the other direction to see if secreted factors from the heart in your mechanism actually affect metabolic tissue? Yes, that's a nice question. We're also thinking that through the actual cellular vesicles carry this mRNA to travel back and forth to make this uh, vicious loop. Um, because we, although we found this for for IB, still we believe it's carried by the exosomes, or it's very hard to live longer in the bloodstream to have their function. So this, thank you. Great, thank you so much. So our final speaker for this session, and I'm proud to say we're back on schedule, um, is Manuel Rosa Garrido, who's an assistant professor also from University of Alabama at Birmingham uh, at Department of Biomedical Engineering. His talk is on reverse heart failure through, through CTCF-mediated structural repair of the genome. Thank you. So first thing, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to share um, our research with all of you in such a nice meeting. So, Today I'm going to talk to you about this project that we have in the lab where we are trying to reverse in, um, heart failure by modifying chromatin structure. Okay, so as uh, everybody knows here, cardiac disease is a pathology where the heart increases its size to try to compensate its lack of activity in an initial phase uh, called hypertrophy. So hypertrophy is uh, reversible in some cases and the pregnancy and the uh, cases of the professional athletes when they stop their training. The problem <laughs> appears when we keep this condition for a very long time. When this thing happens, the heart is not able to deal with it and enters what we call heart failure. Okay, so during all this process, there is a change in the transcriptional profile of the cells of the heart that are controlled by different epigenetic factors, like DNA methylation, the position of histone marks, chromatin uh, compaction, and uh, activity of different epigenetic 
uh, a transcriptional activator or repressors. So all these factors work in the, um, at, the, at the local scale and constitute what we call chromatin remodeling. In the lab, we are interested in working with all these factors, but we are mainly interested in working with high order chromatin structure. So what we want to study is how big changes in the 3D structure of the genome promote changes in expression of those genes that uh, triggers cardiac disease. Okay, so chromatin structure. Let me give you a brief introduction of chromatin structure um, for you to understand better our uh, results. So at the lowest scale of chromatin organization, DNA wraps around a histone octamer to constitute the nucleosome. Nucleosomes are connected to each other by a small fragment of DNA, constituting what we call the 10 nanometer fiber. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So this fiber can be bent in a, project, in a process that is uh, mediated by uh, two proteins, the cohesin ring shape and uh, CTCR. So what happened here is that the cohesin, sin, um, the cohesin uh, ring shape binds to the DNA and pulls the chromatin until it faces a, a physical barrier. In this case, two CTCR binding sites. When this thing happens, the loop keeps constituted and mediated by the binding of CTCF to the anchor of these loops. So chromatin looping is very important in controlling gene expression because it can mediate enhanced promoter interactions. It can isolate genes within this structure and it can be, it can take genes outside of uh, active or repressive environments. If we zoom out now and we go to the sub megabase scale, we can see that chromatin loops are organized in two uh, TADs, topologically associating domains. These TADs are regions of preferential intradomain interactions that are very stable and uh, promote a structural isolation. This isolation facilitates the appropriate crosstalk between uh, chromatin elements that are located in the same uh, TAD and also facilitate gene co-regulation. Another um, uh, factor that is important at this level is the TAD boundaries, okay? This, this, uh, this uh, balance in between TADs. These TAD boundaries are enriched on CTC binding sites and determine the extent of communication between TADs. If we zoom out again now and we go to the subchromosomal level, we can see that TADs are organized into A and B compartments. These A and B compartments are two mutually exclusive varieties of chromatin. So while the A compartments are associated with uh, gene-rich regions, uh, active histone mark and uh, gene expression, the B compartments are associated with gene pore regions, repressing histone mark and uh, gene repression. So AB compartmentalization is very a stable feature, but we and others have shown that it changes during development of uh, cardiac uh, disease. And these changes uh, play an important role in controlling global, global gene expression. If we zoom out again, the last one promise, uh, what we observe is that the chromosome preferentially occupies specific regions within the nucleus. These one are called the chromosome territory. So at this level, gene expression is controlled or influenced by the, the distance of the genes to a specialized nuclear regions, like lamina associated domain or nucleus associated domain that promote a gene repression or a speckle that foster uh, gene uh, expression. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, lamina associated domain or nuclear associated domain that, that promote gene, rep uh, inhibit gene expression or a speckle that activate the expression of the gene, okay? Okay, so what do we do in the lab? So in the lab what we do is to study all these changes, changes on all these, um, chromatin feature and uh, correlate these changes with change in gene, in gene expression of these genes that triggers uh, cardiac disease. Okay, so when you um, are talking about chromatin structure, we have to talk about CTCF, the chromatin regulator CTCF, okay? So CTCF is a protein able to bind along the entire genome by using different combination of its 11 uh, same figure. So the main activity of this um, protein is mediate the 3D structure of the genome by bringing close together regions that can be in the same or in different uh, chromosomes. <coughs> so we got interested in this protein after analyzing the data generated by the hybrid mouse diversity panel. This hybrid mouse diversity panel is a macro experiment performed by two, ex uh, two of our collaborators at UCLA. So what we did in this experiment was to induce cardiac disease in 83 different mouse strains and study G, uh, changes in gene expression. So when we got this data, we was checking what's happened with CTCF, and what we found is that CTCF is downregulated in the majority of these uh, mouse strains. 
Another thing that we did was to correlate a, a CTCF expression with different mouse traits that were analyzed by echocardiography. And what we found is that CTCF expression neg negatively correlate with heart size, something that you can see here. So you can see here how uh, the less, is when we have uh, a small amount of CTCF, the, the lowest amount of CTCF that we have, the higher is the size of the heart, okay? Measured as a total heart weight, right ventricular mass or left ventricular mass. Okay, so at this point, what we knew is that when we induce cardiac disease, we have less CTCF. But what happened in the opposite direction? What happened with the heart when we uh, remove CTCF? So to answer this question, we generate our inducible cardiac-specific CTCF in open mouse using the mercury mer system. So as you can see here, these mice allow us to deplete 80% of, of this protein of CTCF after five weeks tamoxifen treatment. So when we study the phenotype of these animals uh, by echocardiography, what we observe is that they develop a very strong disease phenotype char characterized by dilation of the left ventricle in both diastole and systole and dramatic reduction of ejection fraction, okay, when we compare it with the controls. When we study um, the morphology of this heart, we can see that the heart of the knockout animal is very big uh, or is bigger compared to the controls, a similar in size of what we have when we induce cardiac disease by performing TAC. When we study now the cardiac function, we observe that the activity of the CTCF knockout animals is compromised compared, with the, compared to the controls, and it's very similar to what we observe when we, again, induce cardiac disease performing TAC. Okay, so once that we generate our CTCF knockout animal uh, and, um, uh, and we have it in our hands, we started the epigenetic integrative analysis of heart rate. So what we did in this experiment was to induce cardiac disease by depleting CTCF from performing TAC, isolate cardiomyocytes from the left ventricle of these six uh, hearts, and use these cells to study changes in gene expression, chromatin structure, DNA methylation, and chromatin accessibility. So today, because we don't have too much time, I'm gonna focus on HIC. okay? So HIC is this technique that allows you to detect all intra and interchromosomal interactions that are taking place in the, in the nucleus, thanks to the formation of a circular molecule of DNA that contain the two regions that were interacting in 3D. So when you run this protocol, you are gonna be able to generate an interaction frequency matrix like this one, where the intensity of the red color is gonna give you an idea of how many times each of the regions, of, uh, how many times two different loci of the genome are interacting to each other. Okay, so this one is a small uh, matrix. If we zoom out just taking like a bigger region, we are gonna have something like that. So the first thing that you observe when you perform this experiment is that the genome is organized in these structural units that I mentioned before, the TATs, okay? Topologically associated units. Okay, so when we perform our experiment comparing control, knockout, and TAC, the first thing that we found is that the induction of heart failure promotes a massive loss of intrachromosomal interactions. That's something that you can see here. So here we, uh, what I'm showing you is the top 50 differential expressed genes that we found after inducing cardiac disease rank by the number of interactions coming out from the control. So you can see how when we induce heart failure, no matter how, by depleting CTCF for performing TAC, the majority, the majority, no, all, all these genes are losing um, uh, intrachromosomal interactions, okay? So when we study the, the correlation between this loss and interactions with gene expression, what we found is that a very good correlation between both processes, but the, <laughs> the, the, um, the direction of the chain is not always the same. So some genes are being upregulated here in green, or some genes are being uh, downregulated. Next thing that we did was to study what was happening with the Hansen promoter interactions. So what we found is that yes, the induction of cardiac disease also affects these interactions. So something that I saw you here. So here I'm showing you the top 50 enhancer promoter interaction detected by our high C rank by the number of interactions that are coming out from the enhancer and touching a gene. So you can see again that when we induce uh, cardiac disease, no matter how, by depleting CTCF or performing TAC, these enhancer promoter interactions are losing interactions, okay? So when we study the correlation with gene expression, we found again that it's a very good correlation between both processes, but the, 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 the direction of the chain is not always the same. So some genes have been upregulated, some genes have been downregulated. Next thing that we did was to study TAD boundaries. So what we found is that when you induce heart failure, the TAD boundaries don't move. So the location of the TAD boundaries don't, don't change. But, doesn't change, but the strength of this boundary is massively modified, okay? 
So when we study the correlation between tab boundaries and gene expression, what we found is that while no differentially expressed genes and down-regulated genes tend to be close to uh, strong boundaries, up-regulated genes tend to be close to uh, weak boundaries, suggesting that boundary strength uh, play a role uh, influencing the, the, the expression of the genes that are located close by. Finally, the another thing that we did was to study AB compartmentalization. So what we found here <laughs> is that 4% of the genome uh, moves from one compartment to another compartment after inducing uh, cardiac disease. And the, <laughs> the correlation, <coughs> sorry, and the correlation with gene expression is very good, as you can see here. So you can see here how genes that end up in a, a compartment after inducing heart failure, no matter how depleting CTCF or performing TAC, are being upregulated, and the genes that end up in a B compartment after inducing heart failure tend to be downregulated. Okay, so all these um, results were published in the first um, article for this project. Uh, everybody was very happy. Uh, we like it a lot. But this, um, this project uh, remain, th there is a remain question, there is still an open question in this project, okay? So it's the chicken and the egg question. It's what is first? So is it chromatin structure the one that promote heart failure or is the fact that we induce heart failure the one that promote the changes that we detect by HiC? So to try to answer this question, um, we are now developing this project where we are rescuing CTCF in the CTCF, in our CTCF knockout animals using an ABB9 where the expression of CTCF and GFP is driven by the promoter of the uh, troponin P. Uh, okay, so here I'm showing you by RTPCR and by Western blood that the, the protocol that we set up is working, okay? So I'm showing you here that we are able to rescue CTCF level two weeks after the first injection and CTCF level continue increasing with a peak um, Fun of five weeks after the last, the first injection. Okay, finally uh, we can see here that uh, CTCF uh, level con uh, start going down at eight weeks, three weeks after the last injection. So the specificity of the process has been also tested by RT-PCR and immunofluorescence. So you can see here there is a massive expression of CTCF in the myocytes, but not in the fibroblasts. Okay, so now that we know that the system of the protocol is working, let's see what happened with the phenotype of these animals. So what we did was to uh, rescue CTCF in this animal and follow them by echocardiography. And what we found is that reintroduction of CTCF rescued the, the pathological phenotype of this animal, something that you can see here. So here I'm showing you, uh, well, the, the, this, this, uh, this uh, rescue is characterized by increase of ejection fraction and decrease of the size of the left ventricle, okay? That I show you here in yellow. So in yellow I show you the animals that have been injected and here in blue you have the animals that have, be, that have been injected only with GFP. So this one, sorry, this one are injected with, with CTCF, this one are injected only with uh, GFP, okay? So you see that there is an improvement of the pathological phenotype of this animal. This data has been also confirmed, um, studying the heart weight body weight ratio. So you can see how the ratio increases when we deplete CTCF and is rescued when we uh, put back CTCF in these cells. <coughs> Okay, so what happened at the molecular level? So to see what happened at transcription and structural level, we performed RNA-seq and HiSeq. So the first thing that we found when we analyzed the high seq is that we are able to rescue CTCF level at five weeks after the first injection. And when we do a global analysis of gene expression, we found that the rescue of CTCF promotes a transcriptional recovery of what we see in the CTCF knockout animal. And this recovery includes different markers of cardiac disease like APP2A2, myosin 6, 7, MPPA, or MPPP. And when we perform high C, what we found is that the global 3D structure of the uh, animals where we uh, rescue CTCF are very similar to the control, very similar to the control, and very different to the CTCF knockout animals. Showing that when we rescue CTCF, we are able to reverse chromatin structure and bring it to the healthy state. So when we saw this result, we became very happy because we think that this one answered the chicken at the egg question. It, it looks like is chromatin structure the one that is controlling the phenotype of the mouse and not in the opposite direction. Okay, so to confirm this thing with a different, this, this uh, finding uh, with a different approach, 
what we did was to treat uh, our CTCF knockout animal with Givinostat. This is a histone diacetylase inhibitor that is very well known to have a beneficial effect in the treatment of cardiac pathology. Okay? So what we did then was to um, uh, treat animals with amoxifen to remove CTCF, and when they were sick, we start treating them with Givinostat. And what we observe is that the treatment with Givinostat, as, as it was expected, have a beneficial effect in the pathological phenotype of the animals. That is, again, marked by, uh, characterized by improve, improvement of ejection fraction and reduction of the left ventricle in, in both uh, systole and diastole. Okay, so this thing was also confirmed by the hardway body weight ratio. So you can see that when we remove CTCF, the, the ratio increases and is rescued when we treat the animals with Givinostat. And we also uh, confirmed that by measuring the, the heart size. Uh, the, so the animals, the knockout animals, the heart of the knockout animal is bigger than the control, and the size is rescued when we uh, treat the animals with Givinostat. Okay, so what happened with the molecular level? So what we did was, again, RNA-seq and uh, HiC. So what we found on the RNA-seq is that the Givinostat treatment promotes a transcriptional recovery, again, of what we see uh, in the knockout animals. And this transcriptional recovery includes several markers of cardiac disease, like I saw you before, and uh, uh, several genes that are involved in uh, the process of fibrosis. When we do the high C, what we observe is that Givinostat treatment reverts chromatin structure, but in this case, the reversion is partial. It's not total like we saw when we rescue CTCF, which it makes sense because um, uh, Givinostat, what it does is to modify chromatin compaction at the local scale. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, treatment has an effect at the high order chromatin structure, as we can see, because there is a partial reversion, but it's not the main thing that it does. It's, it, it mainly works at the local scale, okay? That's why the reversion is not complete, like uh, we saw before. Okay, so then um, this data again suggests that this chromatin structure, the one that controls the, the cardiac phenotype and not the, in the opposite direction, and it also opened the possibility to use the epigenetic reversion of chromatin structure as a valid treatment to prevent or reverse cardiac pathology. That, that's what we are doing uh, right now because we have identified all the chromatin loops that are associated with the disease. So the idea now is to target these loops using CRISPR-Cas9 technology and see how or check whether the, the disruption of this loop has a positive effect in the uh, pathological phenotype of our CTCF uh, knockout animals. Finally, I would like to thank everybody in the lab, especially Justin that is uh, with us here, and of course our collaborator and our funding agencies. So, thank you. <coughs> so Manuel, I'll ask you a first question while yeah. someone's coming up. Um, so you, one of your interpretations is that Jiv uh, Jivinostat, Jivinostat, yeah. <laughs> Jivinostat is partially rescuing because it works at the local level. Correct. Another interpretation is that it's necessary but not sufficient. So how do you know that it's the former rather than the, the latter and that there aren't other factors that play a role in the rescue of the heart disease? Yeah, we, okay, so when we use Jivinostat, we use it as a, um, as an alternative to our CTCF knockout animal. The problem is that we don't find treatments that promote an improvement of the pathological phenotype through modification of chromatin structure. It's very, it's very difficult to, to predict, you know, that, that, the, that the improvement that you see is mediated by chromatin structure. So we choose the Venostat because it's very well known that it have a positive effect and because it's working with uh, histone diacetylase, you know. But this one was the only reason. Uh, so our problem is that we cannot confirm this thing using other treatments because we don't know the treatment that directly control chromatin structure. But it still is important because we, what we are showing is, okay, we don't know what treatments are controlling high order chromatin structure, but we know that we modify chromatin structure, we have an effect on the phenotype of the animal. So that's the point of the, of the work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, this is really interesting. Um, can I ask you, you, you su suggested then that CDCF is downregulated in, in various models of heart disease th uh, in, in that you showed, is that right? So we saw, uh, yeah, a decrease of CDCF level in the animals, in yeah. the 83 different mouse strain, yeah. and we have seen also a decrease on CDCF 
in, uh, no, sorry, an increase of CDCF after the implantation of the LVAD. Okay. So what we are doing right now is to take RNAC data already published and see if we can see that there is a decrease on CTCF level on patients. The problem with CTCF is that small changes on CTCF have big effects. So when we analyze the RNAC data, the decrease that we observe, the down regulation that we observe is not significant. But it doesn't mean that this one doesn't have a big uh, change. But so, but do you know that do you know that the down regulation is in cardiomyocytes or is it in other cell types? Yeah, uh, our work is all cardiomyocytes, isolated cardiomyocytes. So okay. when we are working with the RNA seq already published, the majority of that is whole heart. And just one, one final question then: the chromatin disruption of chromatin architecture that you see yep. in in these uh, hearts with uh, different types of heart disease. Do you see different types of chromatin disruption depending on the kind of heart disease you're looking at? Yeah, this one is an excellent question. And uh, we didn't do these experiments. Uh, we would love to do this experiment. The problems of these experiment are extremely expensive because the depth of sequencing that you need is very high. So we are right now uh, working with the knockout animals and with TAC. What can I tell you is that when you induce heart failure by depleting CTCF or performing TAC, the changes that we see are very similar. Of course, there are differences, but I would say like 70, 80 percent of the changes are similar between both of them. We would love to do uh, these experiments, you know, inducing heart failure in a different way, but we still don't have the money. So hopefully, you know, when we have funding, we can do that. But another thing that we like to do is to, because here, this one, we are focusing on cardiomyocytes. But what happened with the rest of the cell types of the heart? You know, fibrolysis is the next thing that we would like to do. We want to know if if the changes that we see in the cardiomyces are, are followed by changes also in fibrolysis on different cell types. So we don't know yet. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question about the CTCF knockout. <coughs> uh, uh, these animals have heart failure. I, I understand that. You got, you uh, uh, disrupted the uh, chromatin loops and the, t the TADs and the, yeah. um, the compartmental structure. It's basically a mess. It's a, a, a big bowl of spaghetti. The <laughs> chromatin right. landscape is totally disrupted, and you've got heart failure. Within a week of, of, uh, of, of uh, overexpressing CTCF in those animals, you start to see improvement. And uh, it's hard for me to understand that in a, a non-dividing cell, how you would uh, be able to restore the chromatin landscape in that, that quickly just by giving CTCF. It, it's uh, hard to understand. Are you sure the effect of CTCF is due to an effect on chromatin landscape? Have you done high C, for example, after the, after the uh, C, uh, after restoring uh, CTCF? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the the, 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 the data I was showing you here. Um, can you guys see the? Okay, so, uh, having done that, then uh, so, uh, what what's the? Uh, how's so the, what's what the we saw is that when we do the high C after rescuing CTCF. We saw the chromatin structure that we have in the controls is very similar to the one where we rescue CTCF. Yeah. So there is a rescue of chromatin structure after reintroduction of CTCF. So the knockout animals, the, the, the ball of spaghetti that you are mentioning, the knockout yeah. animals, it became closer to the controls when yeah. we reintroduce CTCF. But Incredible. this one makes sense because what CTCF does is to, it's like an anchor, you know, to, to keep chromatin structure in the proper way. So if you remove it, everything is disrupted. If you put it back, everything is gonna get def is yeah. gonna get it's back. It's hard to imagine how that gets transported to the right place and right time. But anyway, it it, 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 it does. It, it, it yeah, it does. For example, in the in the TAT boundaries, if you I don't know TAT boundaries, you know the the the, the regions between TAT. So these regions are enriched in CTCF binding sites. Mm -hmm. So in the moment that you are overexpressing CTCF, CTCF is gonna go there. Yeah. Okay. Know? So, yeah, it's very fast. So there are other groups that have done a similar experiment using the degradome, and when they remove CTCF, everything, all the touch disappear. When they put it in one hour, everything is back in one hour. So, yeah, it's, it's very fast. It's very fast. Yeah. All right, great. Well, let's thank all of the speakers for this afternoon's sessions.